With me now is Stan Zimmerman. Tonight we're chatting with Stan Zimmerman. Also, we're joined by Stan Zimmerman. Stan Zimmerman is the director of this play. And Stan Zimmerman is a writer and producer who's worked on The Golden Girls, Roseanne, and Gilmore Girls. With my guest co-host, Stan Zimmerman, responsible for your favorite scripts from The Golden Girls, Gilmore Girls, and Roseanne. Stan Zimmerman, showrunner, and job to hire a lot of the people, casting and rewriting and just kind of overseeing everything. You, of course, were part of the original season of Golden Girls, and you were very, very young at that time. So what was it like to be part of a show with such noteworthy women at that age? Terrifying. <laughs> well, it was like watching a great sports figure or a baseball player hit it out of the park every single time. And you knew that if, especially Betty, if she couldn't get a joke, then we just had to rewrite it. It wasn't the joke. It was our fault. We had to get a better joke. I wrote the Le Lesbian Kiss episode on Roseanne. Because ABC would not air uh, a couple second kiss between Roseanne and Mariel Hemingway. And God bless Roseanne. We don't know what's happened to her since then, yes. but that's a whole nother episode. Yes. <laughs> um, and some man being involved. They offered that if ABC wouldn't do it, they would buy the show back and buy time on HBO to air the show. But we're living in a world now where you can't talk about race in schools. There's currently um, laws happening in Florida where you can't talk about being gay. And if we don't talk about it, there's gonna be continued stigma and continued suicide. And I, I'm a big proponent of having, like she said, having those messy conversations. And I think today was one step towards it, which she'll have many more hopefully on the show. And then that made me think, what if I had cast uh, predominantly Latinx actors in this play, and I got very excited to start the dialogue of what that would mean for them. This is Stan Zimmerman, and he just directed. Yeah, I know. Saturday, October 10th at 8 p.m. Join Vanessa Williams, Blair Underwood, Hari Neff and Wilson Cruz in a one-night-only Quick Center virtual benefit performance of Right Before I Go, a new play written by Stan Zimmerman. Our topic is suicide prevention, and our goal is to open minds and affect change. So that's my dream, is to just go into communities and and work with young actors, and this would be like their first opportunity to be in a play. With uh, Sean and Todd, I think they're coming at it fr from being actors. I th think you saw Sean looking at it as if he was reading it and had to play that part, whereas I think Max and I were looking at kind of a bigger picture. We have to say, this is why you have to make the show, why people are gonna watch it. Being a Libra, I'm all about the balance thing. So to me, it's like uh, the premise is important. I want people to say, I have to watch this. I'm Marcus. And I'm Sally. And we host West County Wastewaters. Why not, not to flush. flush? When I look back, I kind of think, who was that little kid that saw that and wanted to talk about those issues through these women? I, sir, am a lady. Maybe not the smartest lady in the world, but I do know that my self respect is more important than passing your damn course. So you, sir, can kiss my A. I don't like this. Like what? You're here with Robert. You're here with Whitney. I know. Dirk's nearly five years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> then what, Blanche? Dog years? <laughs> and girl, you better work. Girl, girl. Work it, girl. Give us world. Oh, sure, Jam. Here he is, everyone. Stan. Zimmerman! Stan Zigaman! There he is. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hey. Um, hey. Is Julian in the room? I know Julian uh, DM'd me with a message. Oh, he a did? With a question. I know. Trying to sneak in there with questions. Well, you know what? We're going to just start with Julian, then. Then he, he got right in there, didn't he? I know. That's uh... Julian, raise your hand. 
We have a bunch of questions today, too. Let's see here. Okay, I'm trying to find you, Julie. I don't mean to jump you, or I don't know what your format is, whether we talk first and then questions, or... Well, you know what? I'm going with the flow, so... <laughs> I, I am, too. Um, yes, I'm, I, that's my, my new motto, uh, you know, is yes okay. and, which I'm getting from improv, which uh, I'll do a little, a, little, a little push for my latest project. I'm actually going to New York July 16th, for my off-Broadway directing debut. Ooh. Yes, I'm directing this new show called Hip Prov, and it mixes hypnotism and improv, and it stars Colin uh, Mockery from Whose Line Is It Anyway? Oh, and I've been asked to be a director. It's gonna be at the Daryl Roth Theater for 12 week limited engagement so far. And I'm very, very excited. Uh, improv is not my world. I'm very scared of improv, actually, as a writer. I, really? I like my own words, yeah. And, um, but uh, I wanted to actually deal with fear in right. the show. I want to give a little bit of, uh, they're asking me to bring a little more heart into it and work on their sketches, but talking about fear, you know, and I, I learned a lot about that, you know, and um, in my early days here in LA and, and how not to get too spiritual before mm -hmm. lunch, but um, <laughs> mixing, uh, you have, you know, that you have two choices in life, love or fear. Right. And go towards the love. And um, so I have this new job that I'm going to do. And I'm, 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 I've am I'm learned a long time ago what I call uh, taking fear off the table. And um, that was a good visual for me. Uh, not to name drop, but if you know the actress Susie Kurtz. Uh, yeah. Was, uh, yeah, just a couple of Tony Awards. And she, <laughs> was, um, she was on Mike and Molly. She's on this new show called Call Me Cat with... Uh, on my MBL on Fox, and she was doing a uh, arc on my Lifetime sitcom called Rita Rocks, yeah. and she asked me to be her date uh, to a Cherry Jones benefit. Of course, you say yes. Of course. And uh, we're in the car, and she's talking about uh, she never understood how we write sitcoms week after week, new episodes. Like, why was I not scared? And I told her that we early on just decided to take beer off the table, and just we knew. Even if the script was a little messy at the beginning of the week, by the end, it's going to be smooth and beautiful. Right. And uh, that's worked well for me because I know a lot of people like to live in that land of fear and it eats them up. And I just don't think that's healthy for you. It's just trust your uh, trust yourself and your instincts and um, and and live. And that's kind of helped me. Um, and I, you know, I heard from her when she was doing House of Blue Leaves at Lincoln Center in New York. Oh, I love that show. She won a Tony for it. She said she did not know as an actor what she was doing until the night before. <laughs> it opened, the night before it opened. All during rehearsals preview, she just couldn't quite find herself in the part. Isn't that amazing? You think someone at that level, at that point of her life, yeah. still having, and uh, so it really taught me that, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, you can have fears and anxieties and just how you deal with them. Well, it's interesting too, how you said, you know, fear and love. And you, if you take the, the love into the fear, it's love. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so nice. So I want to add that to, uh, if you all come to New York and you see this hip prop show. So what it is, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, they bring up 20 people on stage, hypnotize them, there's a hypnotist hypnotizes them and then five, four or five people stay and do uh, four or five sketches with Colin Mokri, uh, all improv and they're hypnotized. I don't understand, but, um, but what I want to talk about is fear because I would never get up. I have never done karaoke. Right. <laughs> I've never, I don't like improv. Okay, um, when I come to LA, we got to go karaoke. No, you won't. <laughs> Why not? I'm too old. <laughs> oh, please, <laughs> please. Oh, old. <laughs> Um, but then I thought after the first time I saw this hip prop show and I thought, um, why is there, where's there, why is there fear with improv? Are we afraid of making a fool of ourselves? And then I thought, what do we do every day when we wake up? We improv our life. So can you imagine going through life with that, uh, with no fear and no judgment like you are when you're hypnotized. And that's all hypnotism, it does. It just takes away that and brings you back to when you were a child and you were able to play and you didn't have all those things in your head about don't, you can't do this, you can't do that, all the limitations mm. that adults put on us. So um, 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the little heart to the show anyway. So I love that. Yeah. I love I love that. Go go, go into the fear. I, yeah. I just heard that like Luke. Um, <laughs> go to the fear. Question: When again is it? Uh, um, it the the show starts previews August 12th. We open the 22nd, and it, right now it's scheduled to play at the Darrell Roth, Roth Theater in Union Square okay. um, through the end of October. I'm hoping right. it goes longer. They're hoping it goes to Vegas and tours and London and, you know, yeah. the world. <laughs> the world. All right. So, well, we got to get out to New York. Yeah. Okay. It, it'll be here, though, at some point. I love this. Well, talking, you know, I love that we're just on a roller coaster ride today. And now yes, we're going to yeah. just, we're, I love how you started with that. Because I'm actually going um, to New York this summer, too. So I'm going to see if it's during the same time. And although I'm seeing Jamie Brewer, who's on Broadway. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, so if she's still around there. You, yeah. You, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Cor Corsicano is the play. OK. Um, but yeah, oh, it'll be great. Well, Julian, don't leave. I see you're leaving because we were going to get you in next. OK, we're going to we're going to add add a spotlight for Julian. There he is. You've been connecting with uh, the man himself, Mr. Stan Zimmerman, and let's see, unmute. Hey, Stan. Hello. What, what, what's it like growing up, growing up as, a, as a child? It's like growing up as a child? Um, I had a very active imagination. Yeah, I was growing up as a child. Um, I started making up plays and I would get neighborhood kids into my basement and we would put on the plays. And um, when I, I, so then we started bringing the plays to school. I, for some reason, I got up the nerve to ask my teacher if we could put on the plays at school. She didn't ask me what they were about. She trusted me, big mistake. And <laughs> she gathered all the people from my that grade, sit on, you know, and sit and watch the play. And then she called my mother and said, um, I think he has something and he should go to theater school. And she recommended this school called Cranbrook Theater School in the Detroit area. And I went there and uh, they only take eight and up and I was seven and a half, wow. but they needed boys. And I guess whatever I said in the interview, um, she came out and she said to my mother, we'll take them. And I started going to this theater school but the plays that they made us do, I hated. <laughs> they were very corny and they were about like the princess and the pea and all these oh. like, yeah. So- You wanted course, House of Blue Leaves. <laughs> no, there was no, no House of Blue Leaves, nothing really serious. Yes. So I started turning them into comedy and yeah. I would dress up as different characters and be funny and add little lines. And they were not happy about that until I went on stage and got all these laughs. Oh. And then they were just like, Keep doing it, do whatever you want to do to the plays. And that really got me that first time I heard people laugh at something I did, I was like, I have to be in this business, whether it's acting or writing or something. And well, it's it, it, you said, I mean, you were on stage, you got that, that applause. What, why, what made you go more to writing than acting? Uh, the reason I did get accepted to NYU uh, drama undergrad, you had to audition to get in. And I was in my uh, sophomore year. I, I went, to, I got an audition, a big audition for a CBS pilot. And it was for a page. It, it, the show was about Washington pages. Yeah. And I went in and read and I was so nervous that my face felt like it was shaking. I could feel it shaking for nerves. Yeah. And I just couldn't relax. And I was so uncomfortable. I was super young and uh, not out now that it's Happy Pride Month. Um, and I thought, maybe this isn't for me. I, was, I, was, I, I couldn't get comfortable in an audition, which mm. is funny because I'm teaching audition classes now. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, writing and using my imagination, I met my writing partner at NYU. And in between classes, we just started writing sitcom pilot yeah. and those doors just kept opening and opening so I kept going through those doors and there was something more comfortable about for me uh, when I went into a room it was because someone read my writing and liked it whereas when you're an actor sometimes you feel you're going to a room 
I, I was so self-conscious that I felt like I wasn't wanted there, I guess. Yeah. And what I tell my acting students is, no, you're in the room because we want you. We want to see you. We're rooting for you. And especially on a sitcom, we're hoping that part's cast. Go to the next one. You know, you're doing 20 zillion things at once. Yeah. So um, actually, when you walk, when you go into a casting room, everyone in that room is hoping that you're their answer. I love which, that. Which, which you don't normally think. You know, you think they're going to be, you know, judging you and hating you. And no, they, they want you to be the best that you can be. And when they give notes, it's because they see something in you mm. and hope that you can get to it. Now, so as a, as a writer, your face doesn't like twitch like you it was with an actor. Is that true? Uh, it doesn't. Um, no, it doesn't. It just it was uh, it was very relaxing because I knew they thought I was funny or clever. I write, my writing was somehow removed. And at the yeah. time, I didn't really realize it's the same thing. It's from my heart. It's part of me. Yeah. Um, and so now, you know, even though as a writer, you go into tons of meetings, you have to go pitch your little heart out. Yeah. Um, and um, I was only maybe real nervous at the first big pitch we had at CBS. Right. And we literally wrote our pitch out on index cards. And I read it like, Da, 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 da. I don't think I looked up. Ba, 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 ba. Finished the pitch. I put it down. The head of CBS says, "Is there anything else you'd like to do?" I thought he meant as a career. <laughs> he just meant, "Is there another show idea?" We don't right. want. To, we don't want to do the show you pitched. Is there another show idea? And we did actually write a, a pilot for CBS that that year, oh. off of our very, very, very first staff writing job. What was that? I can't say. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't say. I can't say. It's all online. Well, was, no. What about? It was, what? it was not a great. Te- it was not a great show. It lasted thirteen episodes. Right. Um, but we had amazing guest stars: Roy Orbison, Don Cornelius from Soul Train. I mean, it was that was pretty spectacular. Oh my God, that's great. No, what was? If I may go back just for a little while, what was the first play that you ever wrote, or first something? Play? Yeah. Or or like you said, oh, you. Pilot. No, I mean, when you were in school, when you were like young. Oh, it was just rewriting the, you know, just rewriting those stupid princess and the peas plays. Oh, and you just and made. Then, yeah, and then I did my own abridged version of Fiddler on the Roof in my basement. Ah! It was basically the songs, you know, and maybe. Did you play them all? You played all the characters. Oh, I directed it. Oh. Yeah, I was the director. I Even back then, yeah, I got the neighborhood kids that could sing. Or right. I thought they could sing. Um, so yeah, I was interested in directing, creating, and I guess really producing because I was bringing all these elements together. Right. At a very, very early age. I was very serious about things. At seven years old, I would get variety subscription sent to my house in Detroit. Yeah. And I would memorize every Broadway show, what theater it was at. I was obsessed. I, I created my own TV network in my bedroom. And I counter-programmed against the other networks seven days a week of shows. I so, love that. And I loved reading it on your website is great. If you, everybody, if you haven't gone to Stan's website, go because it is a journey. And I was reading journey. all of this. It, it's, it's wonderful. I know, I've got, I've got to edit it. It's a bit much, but uh, <laughs> it is a journey. Well, thank you, Julian. That was, boy, did that spar some, some, moments and history the moment of yes my history anyway uh, um uh, let's let's i love it let's is devon morgan here let's see i know devon morgan said that he wanted to uh there he is mr morgan hi <laughs> hey stan gentlemen hi nice to meet you well i like your last name by the way <laughs> are you at least you're not related to david by the way <laughs> Um, but yeah, my name is Devon Morgan. I, I am my, I, I, I have my first time being a co-writer and I write for Matthew Selden's EV cartoons, which is, you can tell by my background that me and him have. Nice. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, my question for you is, have you ever thought about writing a cartoon before? 
Yes, actually, we uh, helped. Uh, do you know Nanachka Khan? She uh, is a pretty big writer. She wrote Fresh Off the Boat. Um, she created that show, and she wrote a pilot for Lifetime that we were helped. We were going to um, oversee her um, with uh, Sue Rose, and they created Pepper Ann. You know that? Remember that show? Mm -hmm. And they created a animated series for Lifetime called 4WD, and it was called it was four women driving. It was four women in a carpool at a job, mm -hmm. and it really was just them going to work and going back to work. So they wrote the pilot, we oversaw that. And then my writing partner and I wrote episode two. And before we got to make it, and here's crazy stupid networks, a lifetime did, uh, um, they did some research and supposedly they said women didn't respond to animation. And we're like, what the what? How can you say that? How can you say that? And that was the end of that project. I mean, that is so ludicrous. Um, yeah, so we wrote it as an animated show and I would, lo I would love to do work in animation somehow. Um, I, I worked at Cartoon Network for a pilot and it was actually going to be their first live action show. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was weird at Cartoon Network. Um, uh, yeah, we've talked about many different projects of turning it into animation, but I love animation. And I think it's so cool because you can, your imagination can just go anywhere, you know? Right. In a sitcom, you're stuck with two, three, four sets, you know? And that's very limiting. I, I like writing with those limitations and kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. But like with something you're doing, you can go literally anywhere. That so, seems so exciting to me. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to well, try it. You know, and and let me bring on Matthew because, um, as you can see, they both have the evolution land. Oh, cool! Them. Um, and what yeah, twinsies? <laughs> <laughs> so you you both have some uh, uh, cartoons out there on the internet, huh? Right, Matthew. Uh, yes, I am. Do, do, do you know I'm a creator? Oh, yeah, it's a yeah. So yeah, I write cartoons also. He's really talented. Yeah. Fabulous. Did you have a question too for Stan? Yeah, yes, I have a question. Uh, did, uh, I know so if, if you write cartoons, do, do, do you know which cartoon show uh, you've been working on? Uh, like, like back from the past? Oh, I never worked on any animated shows. Um, you know, I wish it had been, you know, like the Simpsons or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know, then I would be, I'd be sitting pretty, huh? And now I have a question about that, about writing for, for a show. Um, is there a show from the past that you grew up and you said, oh, that was one show I would really would have loved to have written for, even back growing up, you know. In the oh, same back time. in the day? Back in the day. Is there one show that you went, oh, I'm really uh, I mean, any Norman Lear show. Uh, uh, Mary Tyler Moore I watched as a kid and interestingly enough I was sent to Russia to Moscow in 2015 to help them develop a Russian Roseanne show ah! and while I was there uh, they had like the whole catalog of, of American sitcoms right. um, and they gave me the Mary Tyler Moore show and I got to hire a, write a female writer which they did not want to hire because they felt women weren't funny yeah, um, to write the pilot for this uh, version of it. So what we do is you you translate the original scripts and then you adapt them into that culture. And it was very interesting to be, I was so scared to go to Moscow, I yeah. have to tell you. Yeah. Uh, but I'm so glad I had that experience of, you know, from my balcony, I could see um, uh, Red Square I mean, it was it was a crazy experience, but I mean, lovely people and the city was beautiful. Oh. And um, but it was interesting. So yeah, so I, I kind of got to help with a Mary Tyler Moore show, but I love that show. I like the shows um, that were more character based. Yeah, not just ha ha funny, but that the jokes came from character. Yeah, I, I feel that's more my style. Well, we, and what's so great about that is you went on to work with people who were so were in those Norman Lear shows, and and oh my God, Betty White. 
for Betty White. Um, B. Arthur was in Maude. Oh, wow. um, That's my mom's favorite show, Maude. Yeah, it was a great show. Um, I got to be friends with and still am Liz Torres from Gilmore Girls, and she yeah. was in a lot of uh, the Norman Lear shows. Yeah. But I just remember as a kid, they were different because they were about something. They were it felt like they were real people you were watching. And not just like all these typical pretty people that, you know, when I came to Hollywood, you that's the only way you could get cast and that's all you could write for were these like very non-real people. Mm. And I love the idea and that's why I loved Roseanne. It was real life. It was all kinds of people, all kinds of different looking people and and there, you know, people uh, died. They got new jobs. They, it was like life. Uh, I like, I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And um, by the way, thank you, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Devon. Great, great question. All right. Um, yeah, one thing uh, you were saying about real life. That's one of the, the the things I love about what you do is you do bring through your work people that are real. And I feel it, uh, not that we're going back, I believe we're going forward uh, with diversity and everything, but it seems a lot of times where I'll turn on a show and everybody's pretty again. I don't know, not what always. Show, what shows are you watching? <laughs> I can't say. You don't <laughs> uh, you, you, need, you need to go to, yeah, another streaming service maybe. No, now, I love that. Like, I love American Horror Story. There's so many I love. Yeah. Um, I think we're in a great time of for television. I mean, there's just so many avenues. And, uh, you know, when I was starting, you had to work your way up to get your own show and yeah. they didn't trust you. And now it seems like new voices are coming out. It's still really hard. I mean, yeah, uh, it's really hard even for, for me in many instances. I don't know if you've heard the whole story of us trying to get uh, this show called Silver Foxes. I, it, I, I haven't heard the story of how you've been trying to do it. I, I mean, the premise sounds amazing and the people involved. Yes, and still we, with George Takei and Leslie Jordan and Bruce Valanche and M Melissa Peterman and Sherry O'Terry. Uh, so it started at Logo. They wanted us to do a Gay Men's Golden Girls. Mm -hmm. And we wrote the pilot and we did a reading in my house. And then they said they didn't have money to make us a, a sitcom. And then we wanted to get it to other networks or streaming companies or cable companies. Not one, none, zero would open the script and read it because it was, because they were old characters and they were gay characters. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, Sorry. and this was just a few years ago. But I think you know me a little bit. I don't take no for an answer. So uh, what uh, we did was my writing partner, Jim Berg and I turned it into a play. Yeah. And I'll give you all the exclusive. It just got picked up to have its world premiere in Dallas in 2023. This is all confidential, confidentially. And my friend Michael Yuri from Ugly Betty will be directing. Oh, he's wonderful. He's a wonderful, good, good friend. Yeah. So very excited. And it really has taught me something I already knew, but don't give up. If you believe in something, figure a way out of it. You know, right. I knew we had a great idea and it was just, and it was attracting really interesting people, but Maybe TV wasn't the place that it was going to open that door. Maybe they have to see it on stage and it's a big success on stage. And then they'll come running at us and saying, this is a TV show or a movie or, you know. Right. Um, you know, and Lucille Ball had the same thing when she wanted to cast her husband, Desi Arnaz in I Love Lucy. The network said, no, America yeah. will never buy him as your husband. So she made these little plays and went on the road and the network got to see that they loved him in this part. So it's just figuring ways to get there, you know, and. Um, being... Well, it's interesting you're saying that too, because I just watched, uh, uh, binge watched with my mom and my brother, um, Love on the Spectrum mm -hmm. uh, on Netflix, the, the American version. And I know several people uh, in that show. And one of them, the one that is the standout in the show, because you were talking about ageism and, and is the oldest character on the show Steve Spitz he's fascinating he's brilliant and he's of the older uh, and and that is what people are writing in about so it boggles my mind how you know these shows that people want to watch they're blocking 
Yes, they're literally blocked. There are people in the way saying, we cannot make this show. And I had someone who was running development for a major streaming company say to me, point blank, the audience isn't broad enough for this. And I mean, so that could only mean they think of that as a straight white audience, you know? I guess, is that what they consider the broadest? And it's like, wake up, look at the world. The world is everything. Like, why are you, I mean, that is such old thinking to me. Yeah. Um, and we should have voices for everybody. Everybody, everyone deserves, it should be the star of their own show. So it, it, I just couldn't believe people were saying this out loud to me, like with no, they didn't yeah. think twice. It's just, we were doing a show we wrote about um, a lesbian adult daughter and her father, they were estranged. They were both, they both messed around on their partners. So they were both kind of dogs. Right. And we thought there was such a funny relationship. Like she learned from her father how to be like not faithful to her partners. And so they, it was a show we ended up filming with uh, Elizabeth Keener and Barry Boswick as a web series because no network, they said, we love this script, never seen these characters. We already did our one lesbian show for the year. So you can have 500 crime shows and doctor shows and whatever, but only one lesbian show. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's still, you know, there's still so many barriers out there, but again, you just got to figure out ways to ways to go. Clean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk about a voice here. We have Matt, Megan Clancy. Megan Clancy uh, had a couple of uh, questions here. Here we go. There's Megan. Hi, Megan. And we'll unmute to the interpreter. Hello. Meg Hi, I'm in the car if you don't mind. Okay. Oh, pardon, pardon me for being in the car, I'm sorry. I'm going to the airport currently, so that's why I'm- Where are you I'm going? <laughs> I'm flying from Boston to LA right now. I'll pick you up at the airport. That's funny. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to know, uh, Stan, how, oh, how do you, how can you come up with a good script? What's your approach? You've been in so many shows, like, you know, the Golden Girls, Roseanne, and I, I love those shows. So, you know, I'm curious to know. Um, I have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> I'm always feeding my imagination by seeing other people's art, music, dance, television, um, painting, the world. Um, I learned at a very young age uh, at acting school to just go and they said, go sit in a mall and watch people, observe. So I've always been an observer and an outsider. And my writing partner, Jim and I would take that later years, we would sit and we would watch people and we would start pretending to do the voices of what we thought they were saying, even though we couldn't hear them. So we just became their character. So. It's, and it's always for me about getting into people's bodies and shoes and understanding what, how they feel. And I think that's why um, I've been so interested in writing mostly for women, but I've just had this very sympathetic. I feel like my heart is very open, but full but for other people. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Wow. That's really amazing. I, I, I've been trying to um, come up with some characters, you know, who 
um, are different, who are not the same, you know, not regular, um, uh, who have different personalities and like, for example, Roseanne's personality, she's very interesting, um, you know, and, and uh, I, you know, her characters, the husband, the kids, you know, uh, in Golden Girls, all the women, you know, have really distinct personalities and like who they are, they're easily recognizable. So it's really amazing. Yes, well, listen to when you see those shows or just listen in life to people in your family, they all sound, everyone's different, the way they speak the words that they use. Some use short words, some use really long words, long sentences. And it's when you're writing for someone else's creation, like I didn't create Roseanne, I didn't create Golden Girls, they wrote a template or a pilot. Right. And it, it's a real craft to be able to hear their vision and, and keep it going. And then also as you start to work with actors, um, we found that like Betty White could do these long stories as Rose. Uh, Dorothy, B. Arthur, like quick, shorter lines. Mm. Um, so that was interesting. And then Estelle Getty started um, having dementia, so she couldn't remember lines. So we had to keep them short. And sometimes you'll see her eating raisins because she wrote them on her hand. Wow. Fascinating. And it really comes from what you said. I mean, God, I'm learning so much from you <laughs> today. Um, to, by the way, thank you, Megan. That was what perfect questions. Thank you. Safe travels. Safe travels, yes. And he'll be on the other end to pick you up. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Your Uber driver, yeah. Uh, um, oh, and it just slipped out of my mind. What was I saying? I was just in Boston. What a beautiful city. Oh, my God. I love Boston. Was that your first time? No, I've been there a few times. I surprised uh, a girl I went to summer theater camp when we were 14 and 15. And we yeah. remain friends. We see each other at least once a year yeah. uh, in New York for Thanksgiving-esque dinner. Um, she was having a big birthday party. And I arranged to surprise her. I only her husband knew. Yeah. You can find it on TikTok. It's so funny. It got like, like over 15k viewers. I filmed her as I'm entering the party. She turns around and she just screams, "No!" And you know why I did it? Um, not to get sad, but a year ago my mother passed, oh, and so I just realized that we have to grab those good moments. Um, and I wanted to create a really beautiful moment with her, and and it was not easy to get to Boston and do all of that, but. I wanted to do travel for a good reason and not, you know, funeral. Right, right. Uh, and, and I, we have to move on, don't we, with stuff like that. We do. Um, I mean, I have so many different questions, but I'm, I, I know we have so many people here who want to ask you questions too. Let's see, is Ashley Anderson here today? I think she is. Ashley Anderson. Uh, I'm going to find you. I'm going to find you, Ashley. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. Ashley Anderson. When do you two want to have a career or entertainment? When did you want to have a career in entertainment? Um, since the moment I could breathe, I think. Um, my mom said I came out of the womb laughing. <laughs> so she was like, and I guess my brother, who is a year older, he came out yelling. <laughs> so uh -huh. He was like, oh, I've got a happy baby. And I really was. I was just a happy person. Um, at a young age, my father said to me, he thought that I looked at life through rose colored glasses. I didn't know what that meant, but he bought me sunglasses with purple frame with, you know, the frames were purple. And he told what me- What age was that? Um, probably 10 or 11. Oh, I love it. Yeah, you know, maybe younger, maybe nine. Wow. Um, but it, it made me think, yeah, I do. I look at life, uh, I don't like to dwell in the negative. I know some people when they get a job, like they'll get an acting job or they'll get a, a job writing a pilot. And the first thing they'll say is, it'll never happen. I'm like, no, enjoy the moment, live in the moment, be excited, you know? 
don't plan for failure later on when it, ha- you know, if anything happens, you'll deal with it and you'll learn from it and you'll grow and you'll move on. Yeah. But some people like living in that misery and that's just not uh, that part of it. But I love, I love what I do. I, someone on the show, I'm working in New York. I guess I responded to her email at six in the morning and she was, couldn't believe I was up. <laughs> I said, I am up, but unfortunately I work in my bed in the morning. I just am very excited, you know, and I get all these ideas. So sometimes I can't sleep and um, there's still this excitement, you know, with, with what we do, we keep meeting new people. Like I'm meeting new people here today. And now I'm going to New York and I'm going to meet a whole new group of people. We get to create these little mini families and I've stayed close with so many of these people and have these lifelong friendships. And I think that's so, what's so cool about what we get to do. Right. Do you ever get writer's block? Now you're going to make it happen. <laughs> oh, never mind. You, no, no. <laughs> I, no, I, I don't. I'm just always just, again, I just, I just feed my brain with so much yeah. content and looking and I'm just such a curious person that um, everything, I mean, I have just like papers here <laughs> like of ideas and things always by every, every, it just in reach, I could write something down. I have, you know, so many documents in my computer of movie ideas for every year going way back, TV ideas, theater ideas. Um, and my book, I just, my coming out with my book, um, hopefully at the end of the year, it's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. And it's about all the wonderful women I've worked with and yeah. Roseanne. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I just hearing you there and, you, you taught me something by asking that question about, do you ever have a writer's block? Because I'm, I'm creating something and sometimes I let that little, I don't know if it's a negative voice or something say, fear. but fear. yeah, right. Fear, like you said. Um, but it's like, no, 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 no. You just, you go for it and you have fun. And it's that, I saw you waking up in the morning with that smile on your face and saying, okay, what's today? And we're lucky we have the privilege of it. You know, when I think about, yes, there's sadness about not having my mother here, but I'm here. And she raised me for me to fly now, you know? And I have to take that into what is my next phase of my life. You know, I've only had a life until last year with her in it. So now what is this new phase going to be with just her energy and her watching me through the moon. And I mean, I talk to her now more than I ever did before. Um, you know, so now I don't have to pick up a phone and call her. I can just, you know, look it's out beautiful. Look to the sky. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, uh, I know you had one other question, Ashley. What was what, another wonderful question? I think you like the best Twitter for screenwriting. What what do you like best, uh, directing, producing, or screenwriting? Um, I'm really enjoying doing theater now because nobody can tell me <laughs> I have to hire this actor, I have to use this music, I have to do this, rewrite this. I get I'm in control. I can write the play, direct the play, cast the play. And I've been doing a lot of that in LA, and it's very very exciting. Um, and just having the response now with hopefully audiences coming back into theaters, there's nothing better, especially with a comedy mm. of um, being in a room with people laughing. Yeah, yeah. That's gorgeous. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, we were talking about Boston earlier um, and how beautiful a town it is. And we have, um, we have somebody here from Boston today. Are you are are you still on, Felicia? Felicia Patty. Ah, oh, there she is, Felicia Patty from um, the TV show Away, and also um, Love You More. Cool. Hi. Hello. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm good. Really. I, th- I thought you were on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. My first question is, um, is directing really hard to do? 
Um, not for me. And my friends will tell you, like, even when we go to dinner, I'll like direct you sit here, you sit there, you know, um, uh, it, it can take over your life. Um, I love directing. That's my happy place. I think, um, there's so much, it's so much fun to be in a room with actors and being creative. And especially when you get like, I feel like with the play, even if I've written the play and I hear it in my head, it doesn't come to life until you as an actor and me and costumes and all this come together. It's like we're making a pie, you know, we make this little pie together and then we present it to audiences. So that collaboration, I love collaborating. Uh, that's why I think I've always written with the writing partner mostly. Um, and it's just, it's very, very exciting. And to be challenged and um, that brainstorming, when I say something and then you say something, you go, well, what about this? And I'm like, oh my God, what about, and I, and I jump off of your idea. That to me is the coolest thing in the world. I mean, and, and you only get that with other people. You know, I, I can't just do it all in my head. There's just something very special about that. And that's uh, why I'm really loving directing. My next question is, what do you like to do best, write, direct, or teach? Um, I have to say direct. Writing is the hardest. Okay. Uh, it really takes a lot of discipline. And that's why it's good to have a writing partner. Because when mm -hmm. we like set time, we're going to meet every day at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Um, uh, directing. Again, it's just it's just feeding something inside of me now. It's just so creative, and I really, really like that. Teaching during COVID was amazing because mm. it came out of nowhere. I mean, I had been teaching acting classes throughout LA, audition workshops. By the way, how can people reach you to take your acting class? Well, I'm going to take a little bit of a break because I'm going to be away. Right. But if they want, they can contact me just through um, Instagram mm -hmm. or my website. Um, and then I got talked into teaching these writing classes and that was so amazing during COVID because we were all having this kind of group trauma together. Like what is going on with the world and how do we stay healthy? And, and to be able to help people be creative during that time. And some people had these sitcom ideas that they had been talking about writing one woman with, like since she was a little girl. Wow. And by the end of 2021, she had a whole script done. She had written a script. So I break it down into a pitching section, a outlining section, and then writing act one. And then a lot of writers wanted to do act two and three with me. And so it's been really, really wonderful to hear all these new voices. And every time I post, I get students literally from all over the United States and the world. We had some guy in Australia who was getting up at five in the morning to take the class. It was all on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so that was really very, very exciting, gratifying when I see people and, you know, you're having the shared experience like you are now. You would never have this if we weren't, didn't have Zoom. So um, it was, it, it surprised me how fulfilling that was. Thank you, Felicia. Great questions. Yeah, you're welcome. So you were, you've talked, um, about having a writing partner. How long have you known your writing partner? Uh, we met our first year at college at NYU. And we just used to make each other laugh. And then he was studying writing and I was studying acting. We kind of brought both those disciplines together. Right. Uh, so when we first started writing, I would always be about what is the intent? What is the emotion of the scene? And you know, even on Golden Girls, I would act out, you know, I do a really good Blanche and um, so it, to me, the, the lines had to come from a reality point of view, because I knew that as an actor, I would ask, why am I saying that? And he had to learn that. And so we kind of, and I was not into reading. I didn't, I, I wasn't really a good writer yeah. in English classes because I was very to the point. And I always felt in school, you had to be all flowery and adjectives and it's writing just seemed so far away from me. Yeah. Um, and then I realized that skill I had about getting to the point was really good for sitcoms because you had, you know, 23 minutes where you had to like get in there, do the lines and get the characters out. Um, so, yeah, it was it was interesting learning a lot from him and vice versa. So would you suggest, let's say somebody is a writer to get a writing partner? 
it's hard to find one that, that you mesh with. I've been lucky mm -hmm. in that I've had Jim Burke since college. And then I started also writing with Christian McLaughlin. We started writing plays together um, about eight years ago, oh. maybe, maybe 10. Right. So I was with, writing with Jim five days a week and then every weekend with, mm -hmm. with Christian. Um, so it was seven days a week. I was insane. And finally I just had to like go pull back. And now I'm just working on, you know, getting all these plays that we've created, all this material, like getting them into theaters and doing them, either producing them myself or getting other people to. And that's that's a full jo job, full-time job onto itself. Yeah. Every day, do something. Oh, I do multiple things. I'm a big multitasker. I actually like multitasking. Yeah. So like on a TV show, my writing partner, Jim, would be running the writer's room yeah. and I would be the one going in and out of the room. I would go, I would give my notes in this, whatever they were writing. I would take a group of writers out. We would uh, work on outlines for the next couple episodes. Um, then I would go to editing. Then I would go to wardrobe. Then I would go to casting. So I was like, but I, you know, like a little bee going around. And I liked it. I just had that mindset where I can kind of do all those at one time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gary, Gary Tewksbury is here and I'm going to bring him on right now. Hey, Gary. Hey, hey, David. Hey, Stan. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. As part of Zim, my question is, as part of Zimmerman and Berg, you wrote that groundbreaking episode of Roseanne, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you know, the kiss scene with Muriel Hemingway and Roseanne. What was it like to create that in the 1990s? And were there certain parameters of how you could build up to the kiss? What, how much creative freedom did you have in that? Uh, well, we, when we, we wrote it and then ABC said, we're not allowing you to film. It. Oh. We can't have two women kissing on a TV show. Uh -huh. can't be done. All the sponsors will run away and it's a, you know, it's a, you know, commercial television about sponsors. And to Roseanne and Tom Arnold's credit, they said, if you won't produce it, we'll buy the show back. We'll take it to HBO and we'll put it on HBO for the night. Eventually, ABC did, they, they allowed us to film it. Right. And then they kept cutting the kiss back, like to seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and she just fought for it. And um, I, I thank her for that. I mean, it was really, it seems silly now, but at the time it was, and it was huge, a huge ratings winner. And it showed the sponsors did not run away from it. They actually ran towards it. Mm -hmm. So they got more popular and they got more press, but it was very odd to be writing it at work. And I'd come home at night and I'd watch it literally on the news at like the 11 o'clock news was talking about us and the show and the controversy. And, um, you know, this was all before Ellen, before Will and Grace and everybody, you know, we kind of, the other people went before me, you know, with shows like Soap and we were groundbreaking and then we came there. And so, you know, Ellen and, and Will and Grace were able to work off of what we did. So it's all a progression. And, and yet here we're back in and you can't talk about it in Florida. So. <laughs> exactly. So the fight still continues, you know, unfortunately, every time, you know, you think we're done fighting, no, for so many reasons, we have to gun control, we have got to be out there saving lives. And, uh, you know, for me, pushing the envelope and different projects that I've done, you know, whether I, I don't know if you know, so I did a, a Latinx version of the Diary of Anne Frank, because uh, I was very upset about the separation of the children at the border. And I wanted to talk about, uh, again, using the theme of having these actors stepping into the shoes of these characters from the Anne Frank time mm -hmm. and seeing what was similar, what was not similar. And um, that was very controversial. I also created a play uh, 10 years ago, a friend of mine died by suicide. So I started collecting real suicide notes and um, I put together a play like Vagina Monologues and uh, it was my first play published and licensed, and now it's being done all over the United States. There's what is that called? Called Right Before I Go, R I G H T, and you can get it through T R W Plays. Okay. And it's um, it's you know Kurt Cobain and Virginia Woolf and L G B T Q and more veterans and uh, yeah. and uh, and now I'm acting going back to acting in it as me the narrator character. Oh, wow. We're about to go do it in Alabama of all places. 
there was a university that was supposed to do it in January with me. And unfortunately, their head of their mental health department stopped it because this person said that talking about suicide would create more suicide, which is the opposite of where the mental health profession is now. Talking about it will prevent it. We have got to end the stigma. And my whole play, literally the last lines of the play are break the silence. Mm. So that's been very different from my normal comedy stuff, but it is such an honor that I get to do it and meet wonderful actors and acts in it, but also now it was, it was done uh, a few weeks ago in uh, East Hampton, New York. It's being done in Monroe, Wisconsin next weekend. And um, I'm gonna be doing it along the East Coast in five cities in the fall. So I'm very excited about that. God, not, I love it, nonstop. Nonstop. And what you were saying too is so important about whether you're a writer, whether you're an artist, whether you whether you whether you're at the grocery store working there. We have to speak up. We have to keep keep everybody in check, including ourselves, and and vote and write and everything. Yes, it's not it's not a given, unfortunately, and we just have to always be out there. I kept waiting for the time when I could just kind of, you know, kick back a little bit. But no, I mean, I've been protesting and, and uh, causing good trouble for many, many years yeah. and probably will continue. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank um, you what brings you joy in life? Um, what brings me joy? There's so many things. Um, just having relationships and creating families uh, of, of through art and uh, having my art. I've been so lucky that it's been, I've had platforms, whether it's television or theaters or films uh, to reach so many different people. And that's, you know, like when we wrote Sure Jan, I never thought I'd be wearing it on a t-shirt. People would be using memes of it. Oh um, it's just, you know, and that's why I love when I go, I was at, in Chicago at the Golden Girls convention, the first one, and I'm going on the next Golden Girls fan cruise in April. Yes, I read that. And hearing stories of what the show meant to people, and people always, they come up to me and they go, I hope I'm not bothering you. And they go, no, I love that as a writer. You know, actors get noticed and they, people come up to them for a writer, you're kind of invisible. Right. So to have people come up and say, you don't know what it meant to share Golden Girls and watch it with my grandma. Like when are it's a grandmother and a grandkid gonna sit down and do something together? And that was something they could do. Um, so I've been very, very, very fortunate to be involved in you know, more than one um, project that seems to touch people. And with my suicide play, I wish I could do it every every weekend somewhere. I've I've had emails say you saved my son's life, mm. and um, that brings me joy. That um, something that came from here not only can make people laugh but can save save someone to live. Thank you for your your words and your healing and your your life changing um, work. And it, it's, it teaches us, it teaches me it, to keep moving forward. The last question I have for you is, what do you want the most at this moment in your life? Oddly, I don't know, but oddly, I just want our nation to heal, to come together and to for for kids to go to school not in fear and to, for grandparents to go shopping not in fear and i guess it goes back to what we we're talking about at the beginning of like living in love and not fear so however we get to that <laughs> yeah i don't know how but we've got to somehow see where we can we i believe everybody just wants to be surrounded by love so let's just figure out how we can march towards that <laughs>